Hi, I'm the Discussioner here. This is a response to criticisms levied against my latest video responding to Telemontrose's Substance Dualism series, mainly to a user who goes by the name of Gopherberg Videos, who initially responded with numerous comments on my video under the name of Top Prospect 67 before posting video response as Gopher Broke. Uh, before we get to his criticisms, I'll address a few of the smaller ones, mainly by a user called Plumblo, who initially posted that my video was hilariously bad while giving me credit for the animations, but not elaborating as to why uh, they felt the video was bad. Uh, after I pressed them for a reason, uh, they said multiple problems with the first minute of my video, first criticizing my claim that... Um, 99% of theistic arguments are not reliant on the soul, and also that the image of Plato when discussing uh, dualism was ironic since Plato was best known for idealism. Uh, Palumbo seems to have missed much of my explanation, or at least the context of what I was saying, ignoring the very next line that without the concept of the soul, most of theology and religion becomes pointless. You see, the argument that Jesus died for your sins rests upon the foundation that our souls bear sin, and thus needs to be saved. Since theology becomes pointless without the existence of the soul, all arguments do in fact rest upon that as a foundation. Uh, now as far as Plato is concerned, Plumblo also misses the context of what I was saying with him. Plato was an idealist and he did believe in an immortal soul, but that was what I was connecting him to. He also wasn't a monist who believed that only the soul existed, but that the physical realm was a shadow of the real realm. It still existed, however, and much of Plato's philosophy, uh, philosophy dealt with practical matters within the physical world. Uh, none of this has any pairing on my actual arguments, though, and when pressing him for criticisms of the arguments in my video, he claims that my evolution example to explain intentionality was so stupid, if I brought it up in my, uh, in my philosophy class, my uh, professor would probably kill himself. Well, I guess I'll have to inform the Royal Society of Philosophy of their apparent idiocy for publishing a series of essays on evolution and intentionality. You can find numerous resources from academic philosophy discussing evolution and intentionality quite easily uh, through searching evolution, intentionality, philosophy of mind on Google search. Uh, there was even a conference on the subject a little more than a decade ago. Uh, these facts lead me to believe that... Now, finally, we'll, let's, we'll go on to Gopher Broke videos and his video response. Uh, again, link in the underbar for those that are interested. Uh, his problem with my videos is not necessarily the facts, uh, but the details of those facts as well as the conclusions that I draw. Uh, he points out that the fMRI scan of the brain was only able to determine the correct hand 60% of the time, admitting that the results were statistically significant but still very low. He draws the conclusion from this that, on that unconscious processes only determine the outcome 10% of the time, the other 50% being due to random chance, and therefore, this shows that the 90% of the decisions were in fact conscious. This is severely jumping to conclusions, and doing so poorly, I might add. There are several problems with his conclusion, uh, putting aside for the moment the implications of even 10% of our decisions being uh, unconscious. Gopherbrook is ignoring several possibilities that explain the data. Most obvious would be that even if the areas of the brain scanned only affected the decision 10% of the time, this does not mean that other unconscious processes that we can't detect are not responsible for the other 90%, so claiming that the study shows that 90% of decisions are conscious is entirely unfounded. Another possibility is that these are determining uh, that these areas are determining the outcome of the conscious decision most of the time, but what determination uh, they cause could change. Perhaps 60% of the time the right region is causing the left hand to be chosen, and the other 40% uh, it's causing the right hand to be uh, chosen, conversely with the left region. Uh, Gopher Broke states that this is an impossibility, citing that the left brain can only control the right side and vice versa. These are true facts, but are meaningless to the implications of the study. The study does not imply that the unconscious mind is directly causing the arms to move. The important aspect of the study was that the person made a conscious decision to move either the left or the right hand, and that the unconscious areas of the brain were affecting that decision. The right, brain, uh, the right side of the brain could be determining that the left hand should be moved 60% of the time, but it could also come to the conclusion that the left hand shouldn't be moved the other 40%. Um, as Gopher Broke and I both contend, we're dealing with very low-level scans here. We're only seeing the level of activity in each section of the brain, uh, not what the activity is actually doing. 
Uh, Gopherbo's continued refusal to accept these alternative possibilities leads me to believe he's suffering from a bit of confirmation bias, only looking at the evidence from the standpoint that best suits his beliefs. We can see this as well in his response to the study on brain injury and emotion. He had requested that I cite examples of brain damage affecting mental or emotional states, and out of the thousands of hits on scholarly articles returned from the search query Brain Damage Emotion, I gave him one that shows that not only does brain damage change emotional states, but how the states change depend on what area of the brain was damaged. Left brain damage caused feelings of optimism and happiness, while right brain damage led to frustration and pessimism. Uh, the conclusion that he draws from this is that since the change is manifested in the same way for only the majority and not everyone, there must be something else driving uh, emotion besides the brain, and that the brain is only a partial contributor to these states. Again, uh, these seem to allude to some form of confirmation bias on his part, given his previous admission that the brain physically changes over time, which means each brain is unique in its own function. We should expect be expecting people to react differently uh, in the, the ways they are uh, reacting to the brain damage, which also explains why children born without the corpus callosum that communicates between the left and right brain um, adapt better than those who have, have it severed in adulthood when the brain is more static. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that since people are able to adapt better during uh, childhood, when the brain is changing more often, and people later on are not, this is more indicative of physical causes rather than some unexplained uh, extra substance that there's no evidence for. Even if we were, though, to ignore all the points I've made and take his interpretation of the facts as 100% correct, his conclusions still do not necessarily follow. Uh, Gopher Broke is willing to admit that our decisions are determined part of the time, maybe 10%, but claims that such a low number is meaningless and most of our decisions are still made freely. Uh, the problem with Telemontros is that his take on dualism was entirely philosophical. He did not address any irrelevant science. Um, Gopher Brook was quite the opposite, ignoring philosophy and focusing on merely the science. The theological implications of any of our decisions being determined by unconscious forces are devastating uh, due to chaos theory. Yoan F. F. Wildcard, in his God and Cosmology series, gives a very excellent in-depth exp Now imagine all of the decisions you've made in your life. Uh, now, they have made you the person you are today. Uh, now I'd like you to imagine if 10% of these decisions were made differently. It is nearly impossible that you would be the same person that you are today. Given chaos theory, even if 1% of your choices are caused unconsciously, the 1% will inevitably result in your being an entirely different person. Imagine if, as a child, you unconsciously, uh, your unconscious mind caused you to choose milk instead of juice. That one seemingly innocent choice um, can have a profound effect on your life in a nearly infinite number of ways. Maybe the milk was sour, giving you an upset stomach and it making you adverse to milk for years after. Uh, more profoundly, perhaps you could not go out that day to, due to the upset stomach, which means you didn't meet the person that would have become your best friend, or your worst enemy, or your future wife. Or maybe that caused you to run out of milk sooner, and when your mom goes to the store to buy more, uh, she is involved in a crippling car accident, which leads you to stay home to take care of her instead of going off to college, where you could have been introduced to Christianity and converted. I could go on. Guilford Broke seems to think that I'm under the impression that I scientifically debunked the soul. Of course not. What I do believe I've shown is that the scientific evidence that uh, we have has philosophical implications that undermine the theistic concept of a soul and show why belief in such a thing is not warranted. Uh, he also goes on to criticize my points on split brain patients. Uh, again, these are the ones that, uh, when seeing something with their left eye, can draw what they saw, but cannot speak of it. And when they see something with their right eye, they can say what it is, but they can't draw it. In reference to the first example, he claims that they are indeed aware of what they see, but are suffering from aphasia. He apparently missed my point that I pointed out uh, the person was more than capable of speaking, but that only one side of the brain was aware that they had seen anything, and his contention is patently false. If they had flashed the image of the car on the other side of the screen, he would have been able to speak it, but not write it down. As Noel Plum 99 points out in his excellent video on the subject, a person can be told via their right brain 
to go to their house. When asked where they are going, they will make up a reason, since they have no idea that they were actually commanded to do so. His criticism does not explain the semi-famous line from neuroscientist Ramachandran, who gives an example of another split uh, brain patient's belief in God. So I said, do you believe in God? And the right hemisphere went straight to yes. Right? I asked the same question to the left hemisphere, yes, no, I don't know. It went to no. So have a nice day on this discussion. Out.